Chapter 27, Shattering Armor 1 We always talk about spiritual growth, but it means little unless we get down to the details. To be specific, how do we really grow? With all sorts of conditioned patterns, our normal ways of thinking, feeling, and acting, how do we ever move into freedom? We can talk all day about love and light, higher self and the Christ, but to be frank, the mechanics of personal transformation are usually quite painful. Although our true nature is already enlightened, unless you've become a Buddha since the last chapter, you are still not manifesting total enlightenment in the physical world. Though we all want to grow as much as possible, hoping does not do too much either. So, why are we not enlightened right here, right now, when that's our true nature, or higher self? It's not because of evil aliens, nor the vibratory prison net some claim they have spun around the earth. It's not because of original sin, nor the many dysfunctions of human society, which do, of course, spin their own webs of distortion. This matter of why we are stuck is not as simple as it seems, and peering into it gives us an important angle to better understand our lives. According to Buddhism, the cause of suffering, dissatisfaction, and even rebirth is ignorance and grasping. We can break this down into ignorance of our true nature and grasping at false notions about self and the universe. The primary problem is that we believe in our ideas about ourselves, about so-called external phenomena, about everything. We believe that our own interpretation of events is in fact the true nature of the event itself. In philosophy, this is called reification, to convert an abstract concept into a thing. And to Buddhists, we perform this type of conversion whenever we make fixed ideas out of raw experience and then make things out of those ideas. This is called living in a dream, and all but the fully enlightened still live in some degree of illusion. As expressed in the Heart Sutra, one of the most important Zen teachings, Buddha taught that both name and form, or material objects and ideas, are in fact empty of solid self-nature. This means that things are as they are, and not as we label them. Our definitions do have value in consensus 3D reality, but their spiritual power is limited. In other words, you must forget yourself to know yourself, and you can only save yourself with a radically expanded view of self. Likewise, you can only save all beings, one of the primary Buddhist Mahayana vows, by realizing that they are already saved. Of course, these teachings all proceed from the main Buddhist doctrine of no-self, or anatta, which posits that what we really are, or our true nature, is beyond all dualistic conceptions whatsoever. Are you thoroughly confused yet? Actually, I hope not, since I think that there's a lot of value in such high philosophy. As I often say, love is not enough. Wisdom is also needed, especially if we're to drop false views, or what Buddhists call cherished notions, our pet delusions. Even though you may feel far from enlightenment, it's good to get a sense of the road ahead. Western metaphysics gives us another angle. While they don't talk about no-self or emptiness, they basically say the same thing in a language with which we're more familiar. In these systems, the primary cause of suffering and non-enlightenment is considered self-identification with conditioned patterns of personality, i.e. physical, emotional, mental, which leads to misalignment with higher self, our core being, at one with all that is. Any and all sense of separateness is a product of non-connection and non-integration, with this core being. As Ron noted, the purpose of evolution is to eliminate all distortions to the law of one, to clear obstructions in awareness to full realization of boundlessness. Ultimately, realizing oneness is the same as no self and emptiness, and the goal is to become transparent to full cosmic awareness. Quote, Enlightenment is, of the moment, an opening to intelligent infinity. End quote from Ron. Honestly, we can't make this kind of supreme opening without radical detachment from both ideas and personal conditioning. From the view of full enlightenment, our ways of grasping include emotional patterns, consciously held thoughts, and the deeper substrata of beliefs about reality and the nature of self. While there's relative value to all such notions, and we do need a mental grasp of the principles of evolution, they are still labels pinned to raw experience, 
and we can't realize boundlessness or unity while checking the labels. If you pause in breath meditation to see how well you're doing, stillness is immediately broken. As an old Chinese Chan or Zen master once chided, to talk about a thing is to miss the mark. Taking a deep breath, you might now be asking, okay, so what about armor shattering? The title of the chapter. It just so happens that the primary mode of life catalyst designed to help us evolve, helping us clear old patterns of blockage and realize oneness, happens to be shattering armor. Esoteric astrologers have long understood that Uranus can have a strong decrystallizing effect, a rude awakening that shakes out old patterns. But this kind of shock to the system doesn't only come from starry forces. It's an integral mode of soul contact, a common event in the life of all seekers. Not only is crisis an opportunity for growth, but the magnitude of the opportunity is often proportional to the extent of the personal devastation meted out. In other words, the greater the crisis, the greater the gift. The more shattering, the more potential self-opening. Before we end this chapter, let me give you an example. Case story. A mother is racked by panicked helplessness at the possible dangers to her son and only child on his upcoming overseas travel in a volatile poor nation. But after her panic settles down a bit, her husband of over 20 years has many stroke symptoms and ends up in the hospital for a few days. Shock upon shock, the crisis is compounded. Her old patterns of thought and feeling, denials of mortality, fears of abandonment, self-doubt, and illusions of security and non-aging are all dredged up, and her cycles of avoidance and limitation, embedded in status quo stasis, are shattered by repeated blows. As she struggles through a landscape of loss, the cracking ice underfoot throws her back upon her own inner resources. Ultimately, it presents an opportunity for renewed self-confidence and self-esteem, faith and trust, and a chance to more fully accept real-life limitations. As the magnitude of the crisis points to the scope of the opportunity, a crossroads is offered for her to either take a major step forward in empowerment or instead a regression back to fear and helplessness. We could even say that such compounded crisis signals the advent of a new cycle of soul evolution. Yet, as always, free will prevails. As Ra would say, the purpose of incarnation in third density is to learn the ways of love. And so, the gifts can be received or repulsed. Such life shock can be seen in countless ways, used to buttress both faith and bitterness. It all depends on attitude. How the experience is met and used, where the responsibility is laid, and the degree of latent self-appreciation brought to bear on the situation. To unlock doors of learning and growth, however, one must use the keys of self-love and self-acceptance. And from that opening can come even greater expansion, which will ultimately lead one to final release in the ocean of boundless being. Of course, however, this is a mystic achievement far beyond the work of psychological self-acceptance. On the way to such final release, all our armor must be shattered. As in all true healing, Old patterns and distorted energy fields must be interrupted for new light to enter. In the next chapter, we will explore how the same process is occurring today on the global stage, dealing rude blows to the sleeping souls of Terran humanity.